Welcome to Down to Earth with Terry Virts, where we talk about what matters down here on planet Earth. And today I am super excited to welcome Jeffrey Kluger on the podcast. Uh, Jeffrey is an editor at large at Time Magazine and the author of numerous books, including Apollo 13 and his latest novel, Hold Out. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Terry. Um, we have known each other now for several years, and I think the theme of most of our conversations, well, when it's not about the Baltimore Orioles, who, by the way, are having a heck of a few weeks, <laughs> if you've been following baseball. <laughs> they are. I think they're up to 18 now, something like that. It's been, uh, the, they're going to get the top draft picks. So that's good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Glass is half full. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a good way of looking at it. Um, but uh, the conversation normally turns to space. And sure. you have, I would say, one of the most, you're probably one of the most influential people in the space era, in space. For A, at, at your role at Time Magazine, you do amazing work there, but you wrote a book that got to be pretty popular. <laughs> Indeed. Um, that was Apollo 13. And right. I'll tell you what, that was my first book. And so, you know, this, what I, wow. would, yes, my virginal effort. And I thought, all right, so all my books are going to be made into a movie. That's how this works, right? You write a book, you get a collaborator yeah. in level and it turns into a movie. It's <laughs> So I keep waiting for that second movie. So by Apollo 13, that's the movie, Apollo 13, the, the movie that everybody loves. That was it. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. So I think most people know, most people listening to this podcast probably know the story, but can you give us the, not the elevator pitch, but a condensed version in case folks don't know? Sure, sure. Well, this was, this would have been the third landing on the moon, uh, the third manned landing on the moon, um, right. Apollos 11 and 12. Um, the country had already begun to lose interest. Viewership for Apollo 12 for the launch and the landing essentially fell off the table compared to Apollo 11. And mm -hmm. Apollo 13 uh, was garnering even less public interest, um, even though it was going to be the most ambitious uh, lunar mission to date. Um, and uh, the crew was set for two EVAs, two moonwalks on the lunar surface. Um, and two days out from Earth uh, on April 13th, um, they were 200,000 miles from home. And there was an explosion in the service module, uh, which is sort of the equipment area of the orbiter of the mothership. Um, which caused a loss of all oxygen and as a result, all power to the mothership, um, the Apollo orbiter. And the crew had to abandon ship effectively and use the lunar module as a lifeboat um, to provide them with power, with oxygen, with water, and most important with propulsion, a way to get around the far side of the moon and come home. So what was in going to be what people had seen already as a routine lunar landing to the extent that a lunar landing could ever be called routine um, became instead one of the greatest um, rescue and survival stories in American and exploratory history. Right. Tell us about the crew because there was some drama with the crew in the days and weeks leading up to launch, right? Sure. Yeah, the original crew was going to be Jim Lovell, who uh, had been part of the first crew to orbit the moon on Apollo 8 um, in December of 1968. He was going back to the moon this time. He was going back to the moon, and this time he was uh, planning to land. Um, in the center seat was Ken Mattingly, um, who would have remained in lunar orbit while the other two astronauts walked. Um, Mattingly was a rookie. And then the right-hand seat was another rookie, Fred Hayes, who was the lunar module pilot, who was going to be going down to the surface with Jim uh, and walk on the Fra Mauro highlands of the moon. Um, two days before launch, however, it was revealed that Ken Mattingly uh, had been exposed to German measles through the son of one of the other astronauts. And Ken had never had the measles. So he was medically scrubbed uh, just 48 hours before launch and Jack Swigert, another rookie, was uh, swapped in in his place. So not only did they have to ultimately overcome 
the mechanical breakdown, uh, the emergency of the explosion, uh, but they also had to reintegrate themselves as a crew. And, you know, you talk about the Orioles or any other baseball team. I mean, these teams really know something about teamwork when you have, yeah. you know, a crew throwing a, or, or a team throwing a triple play or a double play right. around the horn. Right. Those are a bunch of guys who have learned to read one another's minds and predict one another's actions at any moment. And the same thing is true of military crews. The same thing is true true of a space crew. So they started off with a little bit of a hiccup in personnel, no slur on Jack Swigert. He was a terrific right. astronaut, but right. he was not integrated interpersonally with the crew the way he yeah. had been after two years of training. No, I can, having flown in space, I can say that would be a big deal. It's like getting a new shortstop exactly. in, the World in the World Series and then having to turn a double play, you know, to win the World Series. Um, but, uh, and Swigert is, they have a statue of him at the Denver airport, if I'm not mistaken. He was they in, do. His post, in his post-astronaut career. It was a bit of a tragedy, I think. It was a tragedy. He was elected to Congress mm -hmm. in November of 1982, um, but he uh, developed lymphoma um, and he died before he could take office. It was a very aggressive case of lymphoma. So he yeah. was relatively healthy by election time and by inauguration time, just uh, he, had two away. Later, he had passed away. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cool statue. He's in his Apollo, um, in his moonwalking suit. It's a really cool, I, I was just in Denver dropping, uh, or seeing some folks and, uh, anyway, so yeah. they, the mission is starting on kind of, uh, I don't know, not cursed, but you know, that's not yeah. a good omen when you have to scrub someone two days before launch. Days. And the other thing, these guys were rookies. That's amazing. They got to walk on the moon or go to the moon anyway. Go to the moon as well. On their first space flight. Yeah, I know. And that's throughout um, cool. the remainder of the Apollo program. There were a lot of rookies who went to the moon. They had NASA had staffed up heavily with astronauts, and there was a right. pretty long queue of astronauts um, waiting to fly. Now remember, they had planned to go all the way up to Apollo 20 originally, so there would have been nine right. more crew members. So some right. of these rookies and some of the other veterans who hadn't gotten a chance to walk on the moon um, would have had a try, but um, budget cuts and the ultimate cancellation of the program uh, right. caused it to end at Apollo 17, which was yeah, stiff six lunar landings. Right, they had to wait a decade to fly on the shuttle, which I don't feel too badly because I had to wait a decade to fly on the shuttle after I got to NASA. It, it, it try, you know, and the rookies now are flying pretty quick because uh, yeah. basically a bunch of guys left the office and there's a bunch of flights and uh, they're very lucky now. But it, it's worth the wait. I can say that. Um, yeah, I bet it is. Was that a Friday the thirteenth? By the way, it was not a Friday the thirteenth. It's funny uh, you should ask this. For some reason, I was thinking about this just this morning. Yeah. it was a. What day of the week was it? I forget which day of the week it was. I think it was right. a Tuesday or Wednesday, but it was not a Friday the 13th. 1970? 1970, yes. So yes. it exploded on the 13th, and the liftoff time was uh, 1.13 p.m. Central Time, which, of course, right. is 13.13. 13.13. 13.13. Apollo 13, and it exploded on April On the 13th. 13th. So, that's, yeah. that's crazy. Uh, NASA has a way with numbers, you know, our, our three accidents, fatal accidents all basically happened the, the same week of January, you know, the, within a couple of days of each other at the end of January. <clears throat> um, so these guys, the thing that exploded was the fuel cell that uses hydrogen and oxygen right? and you mix them together and that makes electricity and water, which ironically, we're talking about the hydrogen economy. Right, to, you know, and hopefully, and we'll be able to make hydrogen cleanly and cheaply and on mass production. And if we can do that, we can all have unlimited energy. I mean, it's an amazing technology. Exactly. And NASA was using that 50, over 50 years ago. Yeah, yeah. The fuel cells were key to, uh, to the functioning of the spacecraft. There were three fuel cells. Mm -hmm. And as you say, they were fed by super cooled oxygen and super cooled hydrogen um, that combined to make electricity and in so doing also produce water as a byproduct. So mm -hmm. they were pretty efficient and they were miniaturized so that they mm -hmm. could- um, you know, Yeah, they're just little uh, boxes, yeah. 
exactly. We, we had him on the shuttle. And yeah. in fact, you know, as a kid, I grew up in love with space and Apollo. I had all, all my posters on my wall were rockets and galaxies and stuff. And I went to the Smithsonian and saw my first IMAX movie to fly, which yeah. is still one of the best movies ever made, I think. And um, you see the capsules and it, I was like, cool, those are, you know, those are cool. And then I got to be an astronaut and I trained in the shuttle for years. And then I went and I saw an Apollo capsule one time and I was like, that is the same exact cockpit as the space shuttle. They use the same acronyms. It's the same font. The yeah. switches are exactly the same. And what I learned at NASA, once something works, it never gets changed again. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, you know, it, the, the ISS is run on 386 processors. I think we bought like thousands of them in the nineties and they work. And so we're not going to change it. And, uh, it, and, and as part of that, the same switches, literally on my right panel as pilot, I had FC1, FC2, FC3, the fuel cells, right. you know, it was the same thing that, that worked on Apollo. I think the big difference is we don't stir the tanks. <laughs> yes. And that's a very good thing. Yes. Right. On Apollo 13, that was what caused the problem. Um, the liquid hydrogen would tend to turn slushy and would stratify. So it would be liquid right. at the top and icier at the bottom. And they had basically a fan that was immersed in the liquid oxygen to stir them periodically to, to even it out, to smooth it. Um, and the fan had a, as it happened due to testing accidents and various breakdowns along the quality control route, um, the fan had a frayed wire um, in its, or a frayed wire in the fan and when the switch was thrown, uh, a spark jumped and ignited the liquid oxygen as if it were a tank of gasoline. I mean, it's highly explosive stuff. So it's good that you don't stir the oxygen. <laughs> yeah, we stopped doing that. Yeah. You know, that as I'm hearing you say that, um, that sounds familiar. A frayed wire ignited the oxygen. That's exactly what I was thinking. It was the same thing that happened, of course. Um, on January 27th, 1967, when the Apollo 1 crew um, perished in a launch pad fire, and they were in a spacecraft made uh, or filled with 100% pure oxygen at above sea level pressure. I think it was right. about um, 15 and a half pounds per square inch compared to 14.7 uh, pounds per square inch for sea level pressure on the Earth, right. where it's at on the ground. Um, and a wire sparked and that caused the oxygen to ignite. And it really was as if the spacecraft had been filled with a flammable liquid like gasoline or alcohol. Yeah, it just exploded. And the, the way the hatch was designed, they couldn't get out. It took a few minutes to open the hatch and they only had a few seconds. Um, yeah. In testimony, it's interesting. I just did a bunch of research on this. Uh, Frank Borman told Congressman Donald Rumsfeld that um, uh, had they had the emergency hit the button and blow the hatch, they could have, they probably would have survived. Well, first of all, once you open the hatch, it would have depressurized, you know, it would have, the fire source would have gone away pretty quickly. But anyway, so yeah, NASA's two big Apollo accidents were um, oxygen based. Oxygen is super dangerous. It's really yeah. dangerous. And by the way, our producer, uh, Salam Raja just, let us know it's monday uh April. the 13th monday the 13th was the day it happened monday which you know mondays are bad too so everything about that day <laughs> <laughs> so how close were they to dying like uh, everybody people have seen the movie the movie came out in 96 95, 95. yeah 95 okay 95 and yeah. did you write you wrote the novel that it was based on so they bought the rights and someone else wrote this the screenplay or did you write the screenplay? No, I didn't write the screenplay. I wrote a little bit of dialogue here and right. there. Um, some of the newscaster dialogue and I actually got to play the newscaster, one of the newscasters. Oh, cool. TV. Yeah, if you see the movie or if you remember the movie, there's one newscaster who's holding a basketball and a baseball. And he says, if this basketball were the earth and this baseball were the moon and they were placed 14 feet apart, here's how you would have to navigate. And that was me. Uh, That's with, awesome dialogue yeah. I wrote um, and much better hair than I have. <laughs> Were you, are you in SAG? Did you get in SAG? I got in SAG. I, I, and I still, 
I still twice, three times a year get a check for the movie showing. It's usually about eleven dollars, sometimes <laughs> it's seven dollars. And I look at it and I think, you know who else got a check today? Tom Hanks got a check today also. I wonder if his is bigger than eleven dollars. So did Kevin Bacon. <laughs> so did Kevin Bacon. And uh Gary Sinead, yeah, all those. I mean, that was that, that was such a cool thing. SAG is Screen Actors Guild, by the way. That's the union for Hollywood actors. Um, yes, yes. So to answer your question, um, <laughs> they got, I mean, as unlucky as the mission was with all of those 13s and the explosion happening at all, they got exceedingly lucky with when it happened because had it happened after Jim and Fred landed on the moon, um, even if they had managed to, even if they had gotten back up on, off of the moon, and had docked with the um, with the command module, uh, there would have been no way for them to get home. They wouldn't have been able to fire their engine and get out of lunar orbit. Mm. Um, they wouldn't have had enough oxygen left in the LEM uh, to survive. Um, had they gotten back up off the moon, blasted out of lunar orbit, um, and then the accident happened, uh, they still would have been doomed because there would have been no way to accelerate and get home faster than the three days it took to get home and they would have run out of oxygen. So it was really dicey for all of the bad luck they got. The one lucky card they drew was when that accident happened, when that explosion happened. It, if it would have happened sooner, they might not have had enough oxygen too. They, they barely made it back, right? That's correct. They barely made it back. Yeah. And the funny thing is, well, you would know this, obviously, from training. You train for all possible scenarios. You train for even the, the least likely accident you train for because, you know, even if the odds are a thousand to one or 10,000 to one, there's still that one out of 10,000 right. chance the right. accident is going to happen. So you have to know as the pilot of the shuttle. Um, or the commander of the space station, you have to know how to handle that problem. Um, but they never trained for both oxygen tanks um, failing and all of the uh, all of the power dying, because as I've often said over the years, that would be a little bit like taking your driver's ed classes and practicing what you do if you drive over a cliff at seventy miles an hour. You don't practice that. <laughs> I went seventy miles. An hour. An hour over, <laughs> you die. So why, right. were, what to do in that situation? In my book, How to Astronaut, there's a chapter about the shuttle emergencies and the sim soups. Um, you know, were just evil. I think Wayne Hale had. I, I quoted Wayne Hale, the famous space shuttle flight director, about how evil sim soups were. And um, but they, you know, they come up with those crazy scenarios to train us on sure. to simulate the stress because you can't simulate what it's like to be on a launch but so instead of like launching you they just give you crazy emergencies to train for right. but even this one even with all the crazy stuff they come up with they had never trained for that yeah so so gene krantz was one of the flight directors and he had a lot to do with it by the way i got to meet um i went to gene's house last year and really the most awesome human being on the planet it hit his office is full of the coolest stuff you yeah. know the cool and, and he was a fighter pilot first and then he became a flight director he flew f-86s just the one of the greatest americans of all time and it was so, so much fun to, and he remembers every technical detail about the shuttle we we just talked for hours about the shuttle you know what i was doing jeffrey um i went to show him our apollo 11 flight plan that you wow. wrote right. the intro for. Yes, yes. So real quick for the listeners, Jeffrey Kluger and I worked on, we did a reproduction of the Apollo 11 flight plan. Um, it's incredible. It's an amazing, it, it's a gorgeous book, is it not? Yeah, it's yeah. a gorgeous book. It really is a, a, a piece of artwork as much as yeah. it is. Well, it really is lovely. I, I can't show it right now. It's a, there's a website called ApolloFlightPlan.com. So if folks yeah. want to check it out, look at ApolloFlightPlan.com. Anyway, I just went over to, to let Gene see it and you could, you know, you could, anyway, he, it was really fun to talk to him about Apollo and um, doing that. Uh, the, by the way, the, in, the flight plan reproduction is mostly the flight plan, but you wrote the introduction and that introduction is really, really good. Like that's a good oh. piece of literature. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's actually the, it's right on the shelf behind me. I don't know if you can see Oh it. yeah, I could see it up there. It's just <laughs> like Italian leather, 23 karat gold. The, the company that does the, um, 
they do head of state gifts for the U.S. president, and wow. they're the one. They're the ones who made this. So I think they're the best in the in the in the world, really, at yeah. making books like that. <clears throat> but anyway, off of our commercial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so here these astronauts are, and the thing about being in the spaceship when stuff like this happens. I mean, we're trained. We know some stuff. But really, mission control are the brains because they have a lot more data. They've got a lot more engineers who are true experts. There's no way that anybody can be the absolute expert in everything. So we actually have the experts back in Houston. So it was a team effort. But I think Houston really had a lot. I mean, they were like the main deciders of what to do. Yeah. And explain the, the trajectory of how that went. The trajectory of the uh, spacecraft? Yeah. Well, yeah. they were on when astronauts flew out to the moon for the first four lunar flights, 8, 10, 11, and 12, they were on what was called a free return trajectory, which means that they would fly out toward the moon, and if their engines failed and they could not get into lunar orbit, they would whipsaw around the back of the moon and just be hurled home by lunar gravity on a direct path to intercept the earth. So if all of their engines failed, they were on, that's why they called it a free return trajectory, physics would take over and physics would be their guidance system and bring them back to earth. For Apollo 13, they left the free return trajectory because of the place they had to land on the moon. Their landing site required them to alter their trajectory a little bit, which means that had they not been able to fire that engine, right. the lose engine, they would have whipped around the far side of the moon, come back in the direction of Earth and missed Earth entirely and just just gone off into space and been a free floating, right. I've said in, in the book, would have been a, basically a free flying sarcophagus with three expired men inside. Right. Um, so, what they had to do, they went around the far side of the moon, they did not go into lunar orbit, and they had to fire their, the lunar module's engine to get them back on a, on a free return trajectory so that they could intercept the Earth when they... Right, because they couldn't use the service module. So Apollo was like the capsule and the service module were one thing, and then that funny looking spider thing was the lunar module, and they were That's attached. Right. Yeah. And they couldn't fire the service module engine because it just blew up. Right, exactly. And they didn't know there was a possibility that the engine could have still they could have tried it, but could have tried it, but they yeah. didn't dare risk it because right. there was too great a chance it would just be another explosion. And, and there's no way to know because that thing burned up, right? I'm assuming the service module hit Earth and it's gone forever. That's correct. It intercepted so, the Earth's atmosphere and it became a meteor. Right, we can never do that accident investigation. And there's a scene in the moon where they're going around the earth and they are looking at it and it and it's like, this is our one and only shot boys, you know, take a good look. And it was such a profound scene. I love that scene. Yeah. Um, there's a couple things I like about the filming. Did any of those three guys get to go back to the moon? Uh, no, none of them did. Um, Jim, there was some talk, it's funny, there was on Apollos 11 and 12, in order to ensure that the crew would not take um, undue chances, you know, if they were approaching the moon and getting close to the surface and then there was a breakdown of some kind and they had to abort, in order to assume, in order to ensure that the crew wouldn't say, what the hell, we're going to land anyway. You know, right. we're 20 feet above the surface. We're not going to stop now. Um, NASA promised them, if you get close and you can't land, you, this crew, will be recycled right back onto the next mission. So you will get your next chance in a few months. They said that to the crew of Apollo 11, and they said that to the crew of Apollo 12. They did not make that promise to Apollo 13. So they didn't get to go back. Um, Jim, I asked Jim if he would have gone back, and he said, well, I would have. He said, and we were out at dinner with um, mm -hmm. him and his wife, and he kind of gestured toward Marilyn and said she would not have heard of it. And he said, and also, the other astronauts in the program, the long knives would have been out for me. He said, <laughs> who were trying to get their first shot at the moon and I was going to get my third shot. You know? Right, because right, he would have been on Apollo 8, 
You want to he, describe Apollo 8? You wrote a book about that. I wrote a book about Apollo 8. Apollo 8 um, launched at the end of 1968, one of the bloodiest years in modern human history. Um, there was the Bobby Kennedy assassination, the Martin Luther King assassination, uh, the Vietnam War. It was one of the worst years of the Vietnam War. There were riots in the cities. The earth was a mess. And then at the end of 1968, the Apollo 8 crew went out to the moon, became the first crew to orbit the moon. Um, they were initially going to do just a whip around the far side, the way Apollo 8 did, and NASA decided, Gene Kranz decided, we have to go into lunar orbit eventually. If we are out there, we may as well test our engine and we may as well test our systems and ensure that we can do it. So they went out to the moon, they launched, this was another serendipitous calendar um, uh, calendar moment. They launched on December 21st, 1968, which meant they were orbiting the moon on Christmas Eve, 1968. Right. And on that Christmas Eve at nine o'clock East Coast time, uh, they had a live broadcast to Earth. They turned the camera outside the window so you could see the moon rolling by beneath them. Each of the three astronauts described what the experience was like for them. And then they ended with a reading from Genesis. And right. Frank Borman ended that reading from Genesis saying, and from the crew of Apollo 8, we wish you good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. And unless you had absolutely no soul, you teared up at that moment. You couldn't. I've got, I've got goosebumps right now. It was just, it was extraordinary. And you didn't have to be a religious person. You just had to know that here were these three guys who had redeemed 1968. And of all the cards and letters they got at the when they came home, they said the one that meant the most to them was from one person who wrote and said, thank you, you saved 1968. Yeah, that's the line that always sticks out. You saved 1968. Well, not only, you know, the two assassinations, the Vietnam War, there were race riots worse yeah. than we had last year, I think. Yeah. Um, oh. The Soviets had been in Czech. Was that the Czech the Republic Soviets, year? That's right. The Soviets yeah. invaded Czechoslovakia. Yeah. Um, there were riots in, in... In Paris and in the UK yeah. also. And it was just an awful year. <laughs> yeah. If we, and it was yeah. Mexico City. There were similar riots there in Mexico City. Right. Had its own Tiananmen Square when soldiers fired on. Oh wow! So soldiers fired on on civilians. Yeah. So we think 2020 was bad, but if you can't remember, 1968 was pretty bad too. And what a cool um, story to uh, you know beginning to Jim Lovell's career. And by the way, he's still doing great. I saw him at the Living Legends of Aviation. Uh, yeah. Well, it's been it's been two years now, but. Um, yeah. He's an amazing man. He's, he's been doing speaking, I think, ever since. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I enjoy speaking. I love talking about my space experience like once a month or maybe a couple of times a month, but I wouldn't want to do it like constantly for the rest yeah. of my life. And these Apollo guys, you know, God bless them. And you know what? They get paid well. So they're, you yeah. know, they, they can't complain, but they're telling the same story for 50 years. <laughs> yeah. And people have the same questions. And, it's, you know, on the one hand, um, I imagine it can become tiresome and almost automatic for them. You know, at, one, at some point, I wonder if their minds aren't completely elsewhere and they're just, you know, telling mm -hmm. a story they've told a hundred times. Um, on the other hand, I think they appreciated that they were this rare fraternity of 24 men who went out to the moon. That is mm -hmm. a figure that froze in December 1972. There hasn't been a human being outside of low Earth orbit since December of 1972. Um, so they are 24 men out of seven and a half billion humans currently living who right. have ventured out to the moon, either to orbit it, to whip around the far side, or to walk on it. Um, it makes almost no difference, really, that distinction, you know, once you've been out to the moon. Um, yeah. So I think they appreciate that role. And I right. think, you know, they were, they were meant, they were launched as emissaries of humankind. Right. And they were meant also to be emissaries of NASA to the world. And right. 
I think even 50, 55 years later, they still appreciate that's what I signed up for right. when I was 32 years old. And that's a, an agreement I'm going to honor when I'm 92 years old. Right. They, uh, they've done a very good job at that. And when you talk about the differences, so in Apollo, the command module had one guy left behind and he was solo orbiting the moon while two guys went down to the surface and did the spacewalks. So everybody knows Buzz and Neil, yeah. but Mike Collins was the guy in orbit and yeah. the fighter pilot and the test pilot in me, I was always jealous of him, man. Cause I, I was an F-16 pilot, single seat, single engine. Right. And to be, to f and you actually had to fly the thing. It wasn't like today, SpaceX, there, there's literally nothing to do. You just sit there and the yeah. capsule does everything. Right. He, he was flying a spaceship. Yeah. When there was no other human in sight, like literally, yeah. the, he was the only one on the far side of the moon. That's right. That I am very jealous of Mike Collins yeah. <laughs> and all the other, you know, I guess five other men who got to do that. That was a pretty cool job. Yeah, that was a very cool job. And Collins said, um, you know, he said to me in an interview um, in 2019, and as it turns out, of course, he has said this many times before, um, he said, I'd be a liar or a fool to say that I had the best seat on Apollo 11, but I liked the seat I did get. And he liked that seat so much, in fact, that before he left for Apollo 11, um, he was approached, he was talking to Deke Slayton, who was one of the original seven astronauts mm -hmm. and, you know, was later the head of the astronaut office. And basically he made the crew selections. And he said to Collins, knowing that Collins wasn't going to get to walk and that, that he would run the risk of being a footnote um, in history, um, he said, look, when you get back, um, we can slot you right back into the rotation to command your own mission and return to the moon. Um, and he said, no, he said, Deke, if we don't succeed and we make it home, but we don't succeed in landing on the moon, I'm going to knock on your door and I am, <laughs> I'm going to say, yes, please. Uh, funny. He said, but if we do succeed, um, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm not wow. Again, he said, and he later explained, he said he didn't feel like going back into two more years of training. Right. Um, you know, he had been away from his family for a long, long time. And, you know, I think he may or may not have realized you're also taking certain mortal risks. And mm -hmm. if I make it home well and whole from the first lunar landing, that's good enough for me. And How many he, times do you play Russian roulette? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think that's why Jim, another reason Jim Lovell never went back. Um, he said yeah. it was, you know, I think it just, he, he got lucky the first time. Now, Fred Hayes, who was in the right-hand seat um, and would have walked on the moon on 13, was slated to be the commander of Apollo 19. Oh, uh, and he would right. have walked on the moon, but Apollo 19 never happened. So right. he luck. That's still a good, when you're doing your speak on the speaking circuit, that's a cool story to have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> to, to talk about. So, yeah. so um, in the 90s, I was flying F-16s in Germany and uh, we had a lieutenant was digging through some old box, black and white boxes from the 50s. I was in the 22nd fighter squadron and we found uh, that Buzz Aldrin and Ed White had been in the squadron back in 1955 or whatever it was. And we were having this big squadron dining in party and uh, someone said, and I was like, let's get Buzz Aldrin. And I wasn't an astronaut. I wasn't a test pilot. I was just a nobody. So I called the astronaut office in Houston and got Buzz's information. And he was like, hey, I'm going to be in Germany for a BMW commercial. And so I got Buzz to speak at our squadron. Wow. Um, and I, of course, I, of course, you know, that was my dream in life. And anyway, so I was waiting to pick Buzz up and I was sitting in the hotel and he, had, he was spending a few days in Germany. I heard him on the German radio. I used to listen to the German radio station. Air Pierre Eins was the station. And I could I heard him on the news that morning. And he comes walking around. And I had never met him. But I was like, that's Buzz Aldrin. I could just, yeah. you could tell. Right. 30 years later that at the time. And this mob of German men was just surrounded him at trying to get his autograph. Yeah. And like, in that moment, I thought I would never trade places with him. 
yeah his entire life people just want autographs right. you know for yeah. an entire lifetime right and I've, i i always say astronaut is a pretty cool celebrity because you can put the blue suit on everybody's like oh what was space like and you can be a celebrity for an hour and then yeah. you take your blue suit off I'm going to go to the store later. No one has any idea who I am, right? right. You can turn it off. Yeah. But for Tom Hanks or Buzz Aldrin, whatever, um, man, that's a, that's a bird. They get lots of benefits for sure, but there's a burden that comes with that. Yeah. I, um, two stories about that. Um, uh, Buzz said that people all seem to have the same impulse which is to tell him where they were when he <laughs> the landing. And he right. said, as a joke, he sometimes has a, a spiral notebook in his pocket <laughs> and he takes it out and says, I'm writing down what every, where everyone was. So <laughs> where, where you were. Um, he, he remembers where he was. <laughs> he remembers where he was, indeed. <laughs> and you cite Tom Hanks. It's funny, I was talking to Tom's son once, who actually was a PA, on a production assistant on the set of Apollo 13. And oh, wow. An actor right. himself, Colin Hanks. Um, and he was talking to me once about the challenges of, you know, of how Tom has to live. And he said, you know, if they want to do something as simple as do a father son run to a movie, um, you know, they pull up in a car, Tom has a hat on, low right. over his eyes, Colin runs in buys the tickets right. and gets the popcorn. And then Tom sort of scoots in after him. And this is for somebody who is famously sociable and famously right. kind and right. famously right. accessible. And right. even for him, at some point, I just want to see a flipping movie. That's all yeah. I want. To do, you know? Or if you need to go get, if you're at a coffee, you know what I mean? Like, I know he has people to do that stuff, but yeah. It, but he can never do normal stuff. And so that, you know, I remember Cal Ripken was so popular in Baltimore and, yeah. and he would sign autographs until midnight or whatever. But like, if there was ever a time where there was a kid want an autograph and he didn't do it, yeah. like then I, I've heard people bad mouth him. Well, you know, he turned down this kid and I know how much Cal did and how much he signs, but you know, you build a thousand bridges, but you know, uh, you do w one one time, then everybody remembers that thing. And so, yeah, the, the life of celebrity. And you, you've interviewed lots of these Apollo guys. It's just interesting their take on the lifetime of duty that comes with, you know, got, having a chance to go to the moon. That's right. And the one who didn't, re who really didn't do that was Neil Armstrong. Mm -hmm. Neil became, I think it was too, it's probably too strong a word to say he became a recluse, but it's right. not dramatically too strong a word. It's, right. you know, he was a very private person and he remained a very private person. In 2010, I went on a morale tour of military bases throughout the Mideast. Oh, wow. Um, with, yeah, and uh, along the, the, the headliners for the event were Jim Lovell, um, Neil Armstrong and Gene Cernan, the commander of Apollo 17. Mm -hmm. So he was the first man to walk on the moon, the last man to walk on the moon and the commander of the legendary Apollo 13. Um, and I will tell you at one point we were in Turkey and we entered an auditorium. It was a beautiful, beautiful auditorium, all uh, dark wood. It was, I don't know when it was built, the late 19th century or the early 20th century, gorgeous auditorium. And we entered on the ground floor behind the stage and came out and I could just see the balconies filled wall to wall with these students at this Turkish university and the reception those three guys got. Terry, it was like the Beatles had walked mm -hmm. on the stage. Mm -hmm. It was like nothing I've ever heard in my life. And just to be present for that was extraordinary. And this was 41 years after right. the first lunar landing. And still these students in Adana, Turkey were rapturous to see these mm -hmm. It was it was one of the most extraordinary moments I've ever had. I, I've had um, the honor. I've been to all seven continents in the last few years um, speaking, and it's the same response everywhere. And I and I'm like zero point one percent of those guys 
Right. But well, I wouldn't I, say that. But. Well, I, if, even a even a lowly guy like me, just everybody is so excited to meet astronauts. Humans are fascinated by space. It's the one thing that brings us together. There's lots of things that separate us and the politics of the world are going in the wrong direction and blah, blah, blah. But humans are human. I go to China and there's, you know, a long line of Chinese kids wearing their orange spacesuits that want to yeah. get my autograph in China, yeah. you know? Exactly. And it's just a, it's just a very human thing. And uh, I love that story. By the way, I spent years in Adana flying over at Inserlik. I'm assuming you went to Inserlik. That's where we were. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, that was a, that was a big part of my life. Um, so back to the mission itself, 13, these guys, they make it around the earth, but it wasn't like the thing blew up and then let's just sit here and wait for it to land. They had to, there was, and the movie really brings us out. It's like, well, now this is going wrong and now we have to worry about this and what's happening here. There was a guy, Merlin Merritt. I don't know if you remember him. He was a e-com backroom. Yeah. Uh, he, he's in the movie. Um, he was our pastor at our church, like one of the associate pastors, but he was, he was one of the guys that was checking the numbers on that so right. did, what were the what were the other hurdles besides the spaceship blowing up <laughs> well one of the things they had to do was figure out how to power the command module back up remember it was the lunar module that saved their lives that served as a lifeboat but the lunar module could not re-enter the atmosphere it, it just, could re-enter the atmosphere it, well yes it could re-enter the atmosphere <laughs> fully incinerate on the way it, it did re-enter the atmosphere yeah exactly <laughs> yeah it, it, it couldn't bring you home it right re-enter, but it would incinerate um, right you know it had it just was not equipped for that yeah it, it was like paper thin aluminum and gold even it was literally like paper yeah and, the, the thickness, some, some of the walls some of the walls the thickness was about the the, the equivalent of three sheets of aluminum foil stacked right on one another. so you could have punched a hole in it with a pen if you had so chosen um right. But they had to figure out, they had to re-enter the command module, which had been shut down, powered down. Um, so it was basically in the cold soak of space for three days with condensed water all over the, the instrument panel, the very analog instrument panel with a lot of exposed switches and a lot of potential for short circuits. And they had to figure out a way to power that spacecraft back up. They detached, as you, descri you described it well, the command module and the service module. I often use the analogy that the command module is like the cab of a tractor trailer mm -hmm. and the service module is like the trailer part behind it. You know, you, you can't even see it from the spacecraft. You have right. to with a mirror, you can look behind you and see the side, the flank of right. it. Um, they had to jettison that part and re-enter just in the gumdrop shaped command module. Right. So that had to be powered back up and that was only running on batteries and they had a little power left in that. So they had to figure out how to power that up um, on a, just the, the, the smallest possible amount of power that they had left. They had very limited electricity left. And yeah. out how, how do they make electricity? The, the fuel cell blew up. Well, there were batteries in the lunar module. So right. they, they had batteries in the command module um, that had just enough juice to get them back down to the Earth's surface, but they didn't have enough to power back up to right. use all of the energy they needed to do to switch it all back on. Right. So they reversed the flow of electricity. The, there would ordinarily be an electrical feed from the command module to the lunar module. They reduced, they reversed the flow and were able to borrow a little bit of the lunar module's electricity to power the command module back up. So they right. had to figure out how to do that. They also, of course, as the movie um, depicted so well, they also had to figure out how to clean the air in the lunar module of the, the carbon dioxide they were exhaling. And there was something called lithium hydroxide scrubbers. And basically what they did was run the exhaled carbon dioxide through a filtration system, right. clean out the CO2 and reintroduce pure air back into the, uh, back into the, the capsule, um, back into the lunar module. But those scrubbers could get saturated and they didn't work. They wouldn't work anymore. So periodically you had to take the scrubber out put a fresh filter in, just like a, a filter on a faucet that mm -hmm. after a while, you know, accumulates enough 
particulate matter that the, the your Brita filter isn't working anymore. You take right. that fresh one on. They had to take off the the air scrubber and put a fresh air scrubber back in every day or so. The problem was they didn't have additional ones for the lunar module. Um, so they had to borrow one from the command <clears throat> module and the hole for the lunar module was cylindrical, the hole that it would fit in. The hole for the command module was a square filter. So mm -hmm. they had to figure out a way to take the square filter from the command module and rig a system that would allow it to connect to the circular socket in the lunar module using only what they had aboard, which meant plastic wrap from the, the spacesuits and cardboard from the flight plans and duct tape and they built an adapter for this filter so right. it was a terrific scene and it was a terrific bit of innovation on the fly that was a great scene in the uh in the movie round yeah. hole square peg i mean it was uh, the square, yeah the, the classic and and then the, like who who had the bright idea to make them different? Why not make them all the same? By the way, we had those on the shuttle. They were round. Yeah. Um, li we call them lyo cans, and uh, yeah, we we had a crew of six. And when you're on the ISS, it's like being in a 747. So even right. though you're breathing, you're not really increasing the percentage of CO2 because it's a giant atmosphere. Yeah. And when we left. We were all run, 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 run. We all jumped on the shuttle, closed the hatch, and all of a sudden you're in, you know, a large bathroom with six people rather than an office building. Right. And the CO2 went through the roof and it was like, you, and you have certain symptoms. There's, there's a chapter in my book that I wrote about the CO2 symptoms and my head started to hurt and my heart was racing and my lips were turning blue. Everybody started feeling it. So they said, well, you got to add some lyo cans. And so anyway, so we had to go through that on the wow. space shuttle, but that lyo can, like it barely fit in the shuttle anyway. So yeah. that, that was that part of the movie. Okay. So they're out of power in the powering up. You mentioned the humidity causing a short circuit. Well, that That's was right. a big deal, right? Yeah. I mean, NASA had just lost the Apollo one crew. Sure. NASA just lost the Apollo one crew. They were from a short circuit from a short circuit, that's right. Um, they were facing the risk of losing the Apollo 13 crew. Now there wouldn't have been a fire this time if there had been a short circuit because they didn't have high pressure, 100% pure oxygen in the atmosphere anymore. But what would have happened is the spacecraft would have shorted out and then right. it would have worked. So, I mean- Was it air? Was it oxygen and nitrogen? Uh, I think it was just oxygen, but it was low- Lower pressure. pressure. Yeah, yeah, only five pounds per square inch against the zero pounds per square inch of, of right. space. What did the shuttle have? Was that the shuttle uh, was fourteen seven? The shuttle was air. Was air? Yeah. It was oxygen nitrogen? Yeah. The only time we're one hundred percent O two now is in the spacesuit. The spacesuit goes down to about four psi, roughly four point three, I think. But yeah, and that's all oxygen. And actually, that's a wonderful thing because the station air is kind of there's a lot of carbon dioxide in it. It's, you know, 20 or 30 times higher than it is down here on earth. Right. And so the station atmosphere is just kind of like, uh, but when you get in the spacesuit, for as many bad things as there is about it, you get, it's like getting a, you know, high oxygen high or something like yeah. that. Guys yeah. like to, guys like to breathe. Yeah. yeah. We, <laughs> we had an ammonia leak. So we had to use these pure oxygen breathers because it's yeah. ammonia is deadly. And, um, we didn't know what to do with them. And like a week later, after the emergency ended, a week later said, Houston just uh, told us to just release the oxygen in the atmosphere. So everybody on the crew was gathered around and we were like passing around these oxygen masks just to get a hit of, to get a hit of pure oxygen. <laughs> it, was, it tasted pretty good. So they had, so they're running out of power because the fuel cell died and they have to skimp on batteries, which meant they couldn't uh, pure, like the, the heaters weren't on. That's which meant right. it got pretty cold in there. Yeah, it was about the temperature of just a little bit over the temperature of a refrigerator, about 34, 35 degrees. And they only had thin cotton jumpsuits on. Jim right. said that they could have put their pressure suits on, but he said the, the condensation- Then you sweat, yeah. You sweat, that's right. And then that- that sweating and the combination of the the cold air would have just he was afraid that they would all get sick so yeah 
we'll just tough it out. Now he said what interestingly, what helped was you don't have convection in zero G. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you were in a room on earth, the heat from your body rises. So the air around you remains a pretty consistent ambient temperature. The heat disperses and you just feel the room temperature. Jim said that uh, in, in the spacecraft, if you sort of gathered yourself up, you know, just huddled up and didn't move since there's no convection, the air around you would sort of heat up in mm -hmm. a bubble right around you. So you would actually get, it wouldn't be 98.6 degrees, but the air right around you, it was, I analogize it in the book to sort of a yoke of warm air hmm. that would surround, uh, surround you if you stayed very still. But if you moved at all, you would rupture yeah. the yoke and you'd be cold immediately. You'd again. be cold again. Yeah. It's kind of sometimes in the ocean, there'll be a little pocket of warm water that comes yeah. by and maybe it's the same. Yeah. The problem with that convection, though, is that your CO2 doesn't disperse either. And so unless there's fans running, you'd make a CO2 bubble and it'll actually kill you. <laughs> yeah, I, I we had a after the ammonia leak, the fans got turned off so we couldn't sleep in our crew quarters because we would have just had the CO2 bubble. And the place that I went to try and sleep also didn't have fans. And I kept on getting carbon dioxide right. symptoms and I had to move around till I found a place. So they're, so they're freezing. They're worried about condensation starting a spark in a fire. Um, they're running low on oxygen, right? They didn't have hardly, barely enough, right? Yeah, no, and the, what saved their lives, the lunar module was only supposed to keep two guys, uh, have enough oxygen to keep two guys alive for two days. This was three right. days for three and a half days. And what right. saved their lives was that they were, as I mentioned at the beginning, they were supposed to take two EVAs to leave the command, leave the lunar module twice. Mm -hmm. And in order to leave the lunar module, in order to open the door on the moon, first you have to put your space suit on, vent all of the oxygen out of right. the, the cabin so that you've got a vacuum inside and a vacuum outside. If you open right. the door with the oxygen still in it, the air would explode out and rip the door off. So you have to evacuate all of the air in there so you've, you've you've wasted a lot of air vented it into the lunar space then you climb, <clears throat> climb back into the cabin when you're done with your first spacewalk close the door fill it up with oxygen again and do the entire thing the next day when you take your second moonwalk so in order for them to be able to vent and fill and vent and fill twice they had to carry along more oxygen than the first two lunar crews did who took only one spacewalk. Um, as a result, there was just more oxygen aboard. So it was able right. to keep three guys alive for three and a half days instead of just two guys for two days. Wow, I did not realize that. So kind of like what we were doing, we just took these little emergency bottles and pushed the button and it went out into the atmosphere. I guess they just yeah. did the same thing with their spacesuit oxygen. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, so they're freezing, they are scamping by on the oxygen. They had to make the round hole square peg CO2. Yeah. Um, and then they had to navigate and the yeah. computers were not, autom it wasn't a SpaceX capsule where everything happens automatically. Right, and they, and they were, their trajectory was shallowing, um, which means if they had come back to earth this is the actually the explanation I give in that scene when I have the basketball and the and the baseball. Right. You had to come back to Earth at a very, very specific angle because right. if you hit the atmosphere at too steep an angle, they would have entered like a meteor and essentially burnt, not essentially burned up, they would have burned up in the atmosphere. Right. If they entered at too shallow an angle, they would have skipped off the atmosphere like a rock skipping off a pond. Right. So they had to enter at a precise out at a precise angle. And on their way back home, their angle kept shallowing slightly. They later found out that it was it was something in the lunar module that was venting. Venting, bit, yeah. Which was causing a, some tiny propulsion that was right. throwing them off course. So they had to fire the lunar module engine a number of times to do a course correction, but they had no computers operating right. any longer because they didn't have the power to run computers. So they had to simply eyeball it. And in this case, it was Lovell, it was Jim taking a bead on the earth, 
and the earth was just a target in the skin in space and he looked through the reticle you know the crosshairs mm -hmm. and said as long as i can keep the crosshairs over the earth we will be firing true so they fired for i think it was 30 seconds 20 or 30 seconds which is a long time to fire. that's a long burn yeah it's it's a a long, very long burn because it wasn't a terribly powerful engine right um, it had to lower a relatively low light bulk onto the surface of the moon and right. with gravity so the engine didn't have to be that powerful right and it had the command module and service module attached so there's more mass that had to move there was much more mass it had to move that's right Wow. So in order to steepen the angle, it had to fire the rocket towards the Earth or That's away from right. the Earth? Fire it towards the Earth at a particular okay. angle. Right. And they were able to, to re-enter. I mean, they were able then to correct the angle, but it kept they kept shallowing and that became a continuing problem on the way back. They had to fire the engines a few times in order to continue to correct that trajectory. And wow. Quickly. Yeah. And then after all that drama, is the parachute going to work? Well, that's right, because the parachutes were, I mean, the parachutes are packed very tightly and right. there were heaters in the parachutes to keep them warm throughout. Right. Uh, well, here again, you had the spacecraft that was in the cold soak of space for three and a half days. So there was no knowing, no way of knowing if the parachutes would open properly, if they, they had been frozen into three blocks of, of fabric ice. Um, <laughs> there was no way of knowing if the pyrotechnics that were supposed to blow the chute out may have been frozen and not worked either. So they had no way of knowing if they were going to be able to, to deploy the chutes. Um, they also, as you remember from the movie, and as of course, you know from having experienced this when you're re-entering the atmosphere there's a period of ionization blackout the right. you know a great cloud of plasma superheated right. plasma forms around a re-entering spacecraft and that disrupts radio communication so for about three minutes on re-entry you have no communication there's just a communications blackout and at the end of three minutes you should have communications restored. In the case of Apollo 13, they didn't know if the heat shield was cracked. They didn't know if the parachutes were going to reopen. So it was possible they would have entered, re-entered the atmosphere, gone into ionization blackout, and then never be heard from again. Right. Um, they would have simply perished. Right. And as it happened, that three minutes of blackout turned into three minutes and 20 seconds, three minutes and 40 seconds, four minutes and then about four minutes and 12 or 13 seconds before their voices were finally heard again. So the assumption for about a minute and 12 seconds there was that these guys had probably not made it. And nobody was ever 100% sure what caused the ionization blackout to be four minutes and 12 seconds instead of three minutes. Though Jim said over the years that uh, his suspicion was that, again, it was the slightly shallow trajectory that wasn't right. so shallow that it caused them to bounce off the atmosphere, but shallow enough that it slowed their re-entry time um, and left them in blackout a little bit longer. Right. Well, the parachute was a concern because I think most Americans don't know this, but the Soviets had a Soyuz that I flew on. I've got a my model right up I there. Notice that Soyuz model. Yeah. And uh, the first time the parachute didn't come out. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. the guy knew it. It was awful. Yeah. You know, he was awful. on the radio until he hit the ground. Yeah, it was awful. And yeah. um, Soyuz and then, yeah, so the first Soyuz is just like Apollo one, you know, we yeah. in the same yeah. year. In the same year, that's correct. And there was 1967. Soyuz 67, yeah. And there was Soyuz 11, in which the astronauts did go into ionization right. and did come out and landed safely, but there was silence all the way down. Right. Um, because the, there had been a pressurization leak during that three minutes they were in blackout and the crew perished. Um, yeah. As a result, they asphyxiated. They did. And, you know, and it, there is a valve that valve worked on my Soyuz. It, it, it equalizes the pressure because they don't want, if there's a pressure difference, they don't want the capsule to be crushed or when they open the hatch, it needs to be the same pressure. So basically you poke a hole in the side of the Soyuz. Ironically, that happened too, but, yeah. and then the pressure inside is the same. It is, is outside. As long as that happens when you're close to the ground, that's fine. Like yeah. you hear a noise and it, your ears change and, and then you're fine. 
but this happened in space. It had the software was wrong. It, it opened up that valve too soon. Yeah. And the Soviets, just like NASA, decided, oh, we don't need spacesuits anymore because this is safe. We've flown it a bunch of times. And so rather than wearing a spacesuit, they were just wearing this. They're wearing a, a, a they didn't have a helmet on. And and yeah. so they all, you know, they lost oxygen. Um, right. And the Challenger crew that, again, we were launching astronauts in, in motorcycle helmets. And, uh, you know, they we determined that you could probably survive something like that. So anyway, it's interesting that Americans and Soviets were having the same problems at the same time. Yeah, I don't think they were probably not sharing a lot of it. Well, we were probably sharing information with them unwittingly, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there, we weren't, uh, we weren't, you know, actively collaborating and we were learning the same mistakes. Um, I want to talk about filming the movie and the, cause I have some ambition to do some filming and the best part about Apollo 13 is that all those floating scenes, yeah. those guys were floating. They were floating. That's right. They shot those scenes in a zero G aircraft that is nicknamed the vomit comet because <laughs> it flies in these great parabolic swoops. I've got and, a chapter of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And at the top of every swoop, you get about, what is it about 20 or 30 seconds of yeah. artificial zero G. Right. Um, so they had uh, complete mock-ups of the command module interior and the lunar module interior in this plane. And they had the three actors um, in their suits, in the aircraft, in real zero G, um, floating and right. you know, moving in ways that would have been impossible, especially back then when you didn't have the same kind of computer graphics you have now, that would have been impossible to recreate unless they were actually floating as they were in real life. Ad Astra just came out. Um, Gravity came out a few years ago. I'm, I'm good friends with Chivo Lebeski, the cinematographer for that. Won an Academy Award for that movie. Um, it, the graphics are amazing. They're yeah. just, it's not, it's not Apollo 13. It's not Apollo 13, yeah. Because, of, because they were floating. Right. And yeah. graphics just don't get it right. My. Yeah having spent seven months in space that they're, they're not floating. That's a, that's an animated, you right. know, it's like a Marvel movie. It's just animated robots. It's not a real thing. Yeah. Um, and I love that about that film. And I, how many mission, how many times did they go flying to film that? Do you know, it must've been uh, weeks. They must've spent weeks doing it. They were, yeah, they did it for a long time and they got really wrung out because, yeah. you, you know, you have to, they take scopalamine and dexedrine to, yes you know, to counteract. Scope decks. Scope decks, that's right. And yeah. it's, a, it's a patch, isn't it? It's a transdermal there's, patch. I took pills, but there's different ways to do it. Um, yeah. I took pills. Yeah. By the way, if you're ever going to, you can go, there's a company called Zero G. Yeah. So if any of the listeners are going to go, it's a couple thousand dollars. You can go do astronaut yeah. training. Uh, yeah. Take the medicine. That's my, in how to astronaut, that's my advice. Yeah. Um, and yeah, take the medicine. I, the first time my astronaut class, we're going to go up and our first zero G together. And we're like, let's do it without medicine. You know, it was like a blood brother compact, right? We're going to try it without medicine. And I'm like, all right. So I did. And I, it, it turns out that everybody's like, they snuck their <laughs> medicine. Oh my God. I was the worst ever. I, I, when I landed, I went and kissed the ground because yeah. they, we used to do 40 parabolas and it's in Houston and it's a 1960s Boeing 707 that smells like 50 years of barf. And yeah. oh, it was, it, that was not fun. And then after that, I would always take the medicine and it, I had, it was awesome. I loved it. So yeah, 50 years. Did, you, of did you get a chance to do that? I did not. And I always said, I've never been so grateful in my life not to be invited to do something. <laughs> I, if invited, I would have felt obliged to say yes. They didn't invite me and I thought, good, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I now have my excuse. They didn't let me go. Yeah, it, I love it, but you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so you were a part-time actor on that, and you were um, wrote the book, the author, uh, and helped with the screenplay. Screenwriting is different than novel writing, or oh yeah, and I didn't, I didn't write that screenplay at all. Mm -hmm. um, I just wrote the odd little dialogue there, and it was mostly for. Um, it was mostly for my newscaster scenes. So right. I did try when I came home from, from Hollywood that year, I got bitten by the um, 
by the screenwriting bug. So right. I wrote a screenplay, uh, a romantic comedy screenplay that even I said was nothing more than I described it as a diverting little confection. It was not, <laughs> it was not a terribly substantive uh, screenplay and it never went anywhere, but I did right. have experience writing one screenplay just to see. I think there are probably tens of thousands of screenplays every year that don't go anywhere. Yeah, um, exactly. I've had, I've dabbled a little bit. I read, there's a book called Story by Brian McKay and that's kind of yeah. the, it's the Bible of screenplay writing and yeah. uh, it's a different, it's a different skill for sure. Um, it's a completely different skill, yeah. But your book is amazing and that story, I mean, it, it's an eternal story. You know, I, in hundreds of years from now, it'll still be a great story and people that's will cool. go, wow, remember when you used to have to, actually fly the spaceship well people actually say that now because it's know. The, you know boeing and spacex are both fully automated um yeah even the soyuz was pretty much fully automated yeah, yeah. although the soyuz still has analog switches uh, doesn't the, it there are there are some like my job was to pump so the condensate i had to pump the condensate so i literally had a manual handle and i'd have to physically yeah. pump it the commander there, there are stuff you can do and he's got a control stick he can fly it yeah. Uh, and there's buttons that you have to push just like back in the 60s or 70s, even though it's a new panel, it's the same thing. Um, but still, the, in theory, it should take off, dock automatically and undock and land, uh, you know, automatically. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, that's why I love the space shuttle, because you actually had to fly it. It was, yeah. Yeah. you know, as a pilot, I just loved it was the best flying machine ever. We're never going to have that again. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was uh, pretty cool. And I just, speaking of old movies, 2001. Yes. One one of your favorites, I'm guessing? Uh, 2001, uh, it's funny. I Yes, it's one of my favorites. Um, I've seen it a great many times and I watched it with my older daughter who was assigned 2001 for a film class um, and it made no impression on her at all. She said, it's so slow, it takes yeah. so long to do everything. And I said, honey, that's the point because that's what it's like in space. It right. takes a long time right. for a spacecraft to dock. It has to move incrementally, really, right. really slowly. So it just sort of kisses the ship it's docking to. And right. she said, yes, but that doesn't make for good movie watching. So <laughs> and now she and I are screening all of the Marvel movies, so. I, I think it's a generational thing. I, I tried to show my son Alien. In fact, a friend of mine was writing me about Alien. Um, that's one of the best movies ever, I think. It, it, it's such a great story. It's terrifying. Yeah. You know, you don't really see the monster until the end. And it, right. it, it was a great, everything about that movie was great. Yeah. Um, but man, it's slow. And it's yeah. not, it's not just, I call them short attention span where yeah. every scene is one second and right. um, it, it's different. But 2000, I just watched 2001 for the first time in decades. Yeah. I watched it in, actually not decades, I watched it in space. Um, oh, you did? Wow. Yeah. I, I didn't watch the whole thing because I didn't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it was amazing before, I think they made that before, it was like 1968 or 67, 68 when they filmed it. Yeah, yeah. Man. Before the first moon landing. Yeah. That was a good movie. Stanley Kubrick, right? Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. yeah it was that that was a spectacular film. Yeah. Um, well, why, so Jeffrey, I, I wanted to talk about what's going on in space today, but Apollo 13 is just too good of a story to yeah, that's okay. pass over. I mean, I, I think we need to do this again. I would love to do it again. I would love to come back and, and talk about talk about you know, because you do this periodic newsletter for time that's amazing. It's my favorite. That's how I learn what's happening in space. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yes, that's Time Magazine, uh, time.com, and sign up for our newsletters. We have an environment newsletter. We have a politics newsletter. We have a space newsletter, health newsletter. They're all terrific. And yeah, I they are getting to write the uh, space newsletter. It's it's an amazing newsletter, and it's it's how I learn what's happening, you yeah. know, on Mar on Mars, on Jupiter, with SpaceX, on the ISS. Um, th it's just every aspect about space. And the '60s was great, yeah. But the 2020s is pretty great too. There's a lot happening. There's a lot going on. 
yeah. if you like space, this is a good time to be a fan of space, I think. It's a good time to be around. Not only is the private space sector um, booming, uh, NASA is targeting the moon again. And while we're not going to make that 2024 deadline, um, I strongly believe we will have boots on the moon by the late 2020s. Before yeah. 2030, we will be back on the moon. Artemis or the uh, Artemis One, the space launch system, the 21st century Saturn V is set to launch on its first uncrewed test flight in November around the far side of the moon. And the next flight will be a crewed flight, a manned flight around the far side of the moon. Very cool. I watched the first Orion launch from space. Oh, wow. That's I was on the ISS and they uplinked um, yeah. the video. So we watched that on a Delta four. They just, it just kind of went up and came right back down, but yeah. The, yeah. the capsule. Um, so I'd love to talk about that Artemis program and a, a lot of other things going on. Sure. Um, okay. Well, Jeffrey, we have, there's so many more things I want to talk about. We, we might have to do several more episodes because, you know, NASA's moon program, what China's doing. Uh, we have a new observatory launching that's been years in the making. James Webb is worth the wait. Um, we have a new mission going to uh, Europa and Jupiter, hopefully. Yeah. Um, we've had Pluto, we had Cassini. There's just so many things going on. So much going um, on. And the ISS is going on too. So yeah. let's do this again, if not that's two or three good. times. That sounds and, good to me. Okay. Thank you so much. Again, um, so a new novel, Hold Out, check that out. I'm sure it's on Amazon and other places if folks want to get that. It's aboard the International Space Station and also in the Brazilian Amazon. It's set in two places at once. Very cool. Okay. It sounds, I, I'm going to have to check that out. And then also Time Magazine, your space letter. If you guys like space, subscribe to Jeffrey's space letter. It's, it's, it is great. And uh, we're going to come back and do this again. And if you like the podcast too, don't forget to subscribe to Down to Earth and give us ratings. We need ratings. Um, Down to Earth with Terry Verts. So thanks again for coming on board today, Jeffrey. Thank you for having me, Terry. I really appreciate it.